Hello, everyone, and thanks, Steve, for having me here to deliver this presentation. Uh, sorry, I can't do this live, but with any luck, I'm in a kayak somewhere in northern Ontario. But don't worry about it. My colleague, Mark Lederborough, is going to be online to answer your very, very difficult questions. Please make them hard for him. He needs a challenge. We did a study on coverage and drift in field corn last year uh, from an RPAS system. And I'd like to talk to you about it, but I'd like to start with the acknowledgements. First, our funding partner and our in-kind partners. That was Adam Pfeffer and volunteers of Bayer Crop Science. Adrian Rivard, our long-suffering drone operator with Drone Spray Canada. Our grower cooperators, Nick Hoffsumner, Brad Fife, and Dan Petker. And my colleague, Amy Shi, who without her, I could never do the stats. So why did we care to explore drones and corn? Well, there's increasing demand for corn spraying. There's concern about insects and disease. You're all aware of gibberella ear rot and tar spot, which is making its way into Ontario right now. We know that timing and product choice, as well as variety choice, can help with disease and insects management. And there's, of course, an interest in evaluating new application methods to establish these controls. So. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Ground rigs, there are a lot of pros. You get flexible timing, you get flexible product choice, uh, you can choose your own water and spray quality, corner to corner coverage. You can adjust your sprayer settings to fit whatever environmental conditions you're encountering. Aerial systems, such as helicopters, they have a higher work rate. The operator is in the air, it's not you, so there's deferred liability. There's no capital investment for the grower, and it's compaction and trample neutral. Back to the field sprayers, what are the problems? Eh, it's a lower work rate, and yeah, there's compaction and trample to be concerned about. With aerial systems, maybe they're not available. It's a scheduling concern. You may have limited product choices. Certainly, you're going to have limited water and spray quality choices. They can't be carrying what a field sprayer can carry. And there's a public issue, too, in some cases. The perception of drift uh, isn't well accepted and field accessibility things like tree lines hydro lines helicopters aren't always the best choice and along comes the drone the pros are flexible timing kind of like your own field sprayer again corner to corner minimal investment all things considered it's compaction and trample neutral and it's exciting the cons boy it's slow it's the lowest work rate sort of like other aerial systems there's limited water and spray quality choices in canada it may surprise you to know there are no registered crop protection products no liquid no liquid ones anyway and uh, i think we can all agree there's still a fundamental lack of understanding in how to use a drone optimally so that's why we had the study and we really had two objectives that i want to talk about we wanted to quantify spray coverage in field corn at three depths and we wanted to do it on targets that were facing up, those are ad axial surfaces, and the elusive underleaf coverage, the ab axial surface. And we didn't just look at coverage in a generic sense, we looked at it three different ways. We did it as residue by indexing the coverage to the percent of the applied rate per acre. What that means is if we sprayed out X amount of product per acre, how much did we find on the target? We also looked at the area covered, just as an overall percentage of the surface covered. And we looked at deposit density, which is how many drops per square centimeter could we detect. We also looked at drift. We wanted to quantify it, again, as a residue uh, based on percent applied rate. Uh, again, if we sprayed so much per acre, how much escaped is drift? And we didn't do this with... Uh, we'll say a conventional method, which is ground deposition. Anyone familiar with that knows that you set collectors downwind over a great distance and you see what lands. No, we did it with horizontal flux, which I'll explain. Now, the field sprayer conditions, we ran this study in two fields, and we just sort of went with growers' conventional practices because we didn't want to create any kind of artificial situation. We did 16.7 gallons per acre using T-Jet extended range 110s, traveling at 110 miles an hour. And that was uh, performed with the John Deere rear mount with exact apply. And in the other field, we used a New Holland front mount system. So, you know, a nice diverse set of ground sprayer application methods and a reasonable volume. Um, it's not incidental, but it is a lesser part of this study. 
we also explored directlet applications. I'm kind of excited about these drop nozzle systems. They're called Belugas. They're built by Agritop. We also did 20 gallons per acre using this system, traveling at four and a half miles an hour using Greenleaf's Spraymax 110s. And as you can see, it's quite the car wash when you suspend these in between the corn stalks. Uh, we space the nozzle bodies to create uniform coverage. It's a 100% overlap from the 110s within the silking zone of the plant. That's where we focused. As for the drone, well, they certainly change quickly. And last year when we did the study, the drone that everyone seemed to be using was the DJI Agris T10, which you know even a year later seems kind of small and slow to me. But that was the flavor of the month, and that's what we used. We used AIXRs uh, with a 50 mesh that we had to sort of jimmy into place. We flew two meters above the tassel, more on that later. And we used two conditions, five gallons per acre and two gallons per acre. And that necessitated different speeds and pressures, which again, I'll, I'll talk about later. Here's Adrian running a calibration check. We followed good laboratory practices. We established nozzle flow. We confirmed pressure. You can see he's got a gauge mounted there. And uh, as for speed, we used our TK GPS. This was early days when we started, and we really wanted to understand swath. And uh, the reason we want to understand swath is we want to establish the most consistent coverage possible in the most efficient way. But when we started this, our first question was, I wonder how far this drifts, because we have to set up treatment blocks and we don't want overlap. How big should our buffers be? So we went out to the wee hours, and filled it up with a fluorescent dye, and performed an initial qualitative drift assessment. Basically, we, we, flew, we flew to at different altitudes and different speeds with different tips, and then paraded around in volunteer canola with black lights looking for spray. And it was amazing how far it drifted. Uh, and it, it started to build the edges of the puzzle for us about how far apart these treatments should be. Then we started to dial it in. We uh, performed effective swath analysis using this system that Mark might talk about. This is his swath gobbler system. Receipt paper is uh, laid out perpendicular to the flight path. Uh, some non-toxic dye is put into the drone. We fly it over the receipt paper, and then there's a real scanner that turns this into a histogram. So you know we get a an indication of how much spray went where. We also performed something you might, might be more familiar with. We used water-sensitive paper and uh, did some fly-ins based on operation safe. You can see here we've got mounting blocks, water-sensitive paper. You can see the flight path in uh, subset A. We tried to keep it away from you know big obstacles like uh, hedgerows, which you can see there. And uh, we ran it between two poles, spaced the papers out uh, every half meter under the swath or, I'm sorry, under the flight path, and then every meter to the left and right. And that gave us this. When you're trying to establish how wide your swath is, uh, I've heard it said it really depends who you ask. It's not the drone or the setting, it's the interpretation. And it is a bit of black magic. So working with Dr. Tom Wolf's calculator that he built in Excel, we plugged in our numbers and attempted to balance the over and under dosing that drones are quite capable of. You can see that it's it's a rather high and narrow peak on the swath. So, you know, where conventionally we might be concerned with just getting the lowest CV, there's another concern with drones, and that is over and under dosing, because you need so much overlap to fill in those edges. So after multiple passes and multiple techniques, for the 11002s at three gallons per acre, we found the sweet spot two meters above the tassel. And that effectively gave us a three or three and a half meter effective swath width. Quite a lot of preamble before we've ever sprayed corn. So how did we do it? We built eight foot high collectors out of PVC pipe. And then uh, through some creative Amazon purchases, I built big chip clip style collectors. And that allowed us to position collectors anywhere we wanted vertically. And we chose to do that at three different depths, uh, at the top of the silking region, in the middle, and at the bottom. That's like two feet from the top and two feet from the ground, and they just sort of span the middle. Now, the samplers, we oriented them both facing up and facing down, or adaxial and abaxial. And we alternate it left to right between water-sensitive paper and these mylar sheets. 
just to give you a sense of scale, we ended up going through over 1,100 water-sensitive papers, over 850 mylar sheets, and we ended up setting up a lot of poles in a lot of corn. Ultimately, we set up 19 three by three collector arrays. So that's nine of these poles. We set them up 100 meters into the field and 200 meters into the field. You'll have to forgive me going back and forth between imperial and metric, but I'm Canadian and we're mutts when it comes to units. Here's an overhead of how the field was actually arranged. It was a randomized block design. We performed this in two fields. And you can see those Ritz cracker, those gray squares, show the nine poles in an array set up 100 meters in and 200 meters into the field. For the drones, we set up 60 foot uh, wide treatments. And for the field sprayer, because it was a 120 foot boom, it necessitated at least 120 feet in the treatment block. And it, it doesn't give a sense of scale here the way I would like, but this is 1,800 feet deep or 1,150 feet deep, depending on the field. We ran two gallons per acre, five gallons per acre. We ran threes, but I haven't included them in the study. Just stuck with the extremes. We had untreated checks. And what I want to show you is we also used our flux collectors, these poles to collect drift. Those are represented by the X's. I'll just highlight those here. I'm not used to using this little highlighter. And it was tricky. Those had to be set up in the downwind direction and just outside the swath, or certainly outside any potential offset for the swath. We didn't want to spray them directly, but we wanted them at ground zero to begin collecting drift. Uh, the very first thing we learned, I learned, and it was exciting to discover that I was horribly allergic to corn. I didn't detassel as a kid the way maybe some of you have, and uh, corn rash and allergies made me look like I had been beaten in a mugging. So thank goodness for Benadryl, I highly recommend it. I was dressed up in plastic for this entire week, which was oh so comfortable in 30 degrees Celsius weather. Here's a peek at the horizontal flux poles. These are extendable poles, almost like a, a graphite fishing rod, if you can imagine snapping this thing out. They were positioned, as I said, just downwind and slightly beyond the RPAS swath edge. And we set these up at three different distances parallel with the with the treatment block. Uh, maybe, I think they were 50 meters apart. I'll let Mark say that. I can't remember. You can see here the arrows show the flags at the top, this flagging tape, just to give us a gut check to ensure that the wind was still moving in the right direction. Uh, we wanted them exactly downwind where possible. And those had to be carried about 150, 200 meters into the field. They were strung with this uh, braided thread. Again, if you want to ask Mark about it, this is his baby. And they're stretched, boiled, and bleached, or, or whatever he does to ensure they're absolutely clean before they're run up the poles like a flagpole. The spray intercepts these strings at different depths. And the beauty of this system is unlike ground deposition, anything that sort of stays airborne, never lands downwind, at least not immediately, will be intercepted by these strings. We feel they give a, a much more accurate, accurate representation of downwind drift. Of course, we had to look at data from uh, weather conditions. So field-specific weather data was collected at about nozzle height using these Kestrel systems. Not Mark's favorite, but we didn't have cup anemometers. And we supplemented that information using field-level weather summary reports that were local to the field owned by the growers. So I think we had a fairly good indication of wind speed and direction and pressure and all those good things. Here's Adrian mounted dramatically aboard his truck. We applied formulated product uh, at eight ounces per acre. It's a fungicide. It was part of the study. I, I won't mention it. But the important part for us is we also include a tracer dye. PTSA is fairly standard in spray drift calculations. Here you can see the drone flying over the corn. Uh, the reason I have this slide is to show that the corn was visibly displaced by the downwash. The downwash is the air that the drone produces, unlike planes or even helicopters that are traveling at spraying speed, the R-Pass always creates a downwash. And we wondered if this would help drive the spray into the corn. What's interesting to note is when you change travel speed, you change the duration that that air is focused on the corn. This is called dwell time. So the slower it moves, the more opportunity for that air to be focused on one spot. And the faster it moves, the less it's focused on one spot. This will play a role later on. 
After the passes, the samplers were collected into uniquely coded bags. Mark would cut these down one meter at a time so that we got a cross-section by altitude, and they were slapped into coolers as soon as possible, even though the PTSA is very shelf-stable. All the water-sensitive papers were and mylars were collected, each one stuffed into a uniquely coded bag. Boy, we agonized over that. The papers themselves were characterized using a drop scope, which just takes a digi digital image of the paper and spits out a deposit count per square centimeter and calculates the percent of the surface covered. Back in the day when I used flatbed scanners and it took a lifetime to scan these, this is just a superior method. You may be wondering why we bothered to look at coverage so many different ways. Uh, I'll just focus on the water sensitive paper for a moment. The reason we cared about percent surface covered and the number of drops per square centimeter think, can be kind of summed up by this battleship metaphor. Uh, over here in A, we've covered 10% of this surface. Let's pretend those are droplets on a leaf. So if we say, hey, I got 10% coverage, and you think that's not bad, is this really good coverage? Because all your droplets are smushed into this top left quadrant. You've effectively missed three quarters of your target, even though you got 10% coverage. Now that same 10% coverage in image B shows the importance of describing how the droplets are, or deposits are distributed over the surface. Here's the same 10% coverage, but I think you'll agree this looks like you have a better shot at intercepting a pest, either you know an ask spore for disease or maybe a, a sessile insect. Basically your odds of contact go up. And all C shows is if you do repeated applications and you have a good distribution, the odds of hitting the same spot twice are, are fairly low. And it's why we like to spray fungicides, for example, uh, as the leaf grows or, or after weather conditions conspire to reduce residual, we like to spray them over and over and you end up with a, a nice overall leaf coverage. Um, as for the PTSA, again, Mark can speak to this. This is what he did in his lab. All those samples were sent back and the amount of tracer was washed off the strings or washed off the mylar cards. And we did a calculation uh, based on how much we applied per acre and worked out a percentage of how much we recovered. So what did we find? Well, the first thing we found was that water sensitive paper measurements of both the percent area covered and deposit density, when compared to how much residue we rinsed off, revealed similar coverage patterns. So while these might appear to be redundant methods of detecting coverage, one is a heck of a lot easier to use than the other and can be done quickly and more cheaply. So it was nice to know that the two of them uh, agreed with one another. Now, when I say that, I mean both our pass and overhead broadcast from the field sprayer both produce similar deposition patterns within the corn canopy. There was a negative linear relationship between the amount of coverage and the sampler depth. You got a lot at the top, you got less in the middle, and you got far less at the bottom. In big canopies, this generally isn't a linear relationship. Say if you were spraying sideways into an apple tree, uh, it, it tends to decay logarithmically or more. But in this case, it was linear and pretty darn tight at 0.997 R squared. Here it is graphed out. Uh, I'm only mentioning the collectors that were facing up the ad axial collectors because we sure didn't see much on the ones facing down. We could have saved a lot of collectors in effort, but I guess we did prove something by finding such poor coverage on the underleaf side. More about that in a second. Uh, on your left, this part of the histogram, there's the average percent area covered, that's the papers, or percent applied, that's the mylars. Mylars are uh, blue, water sensitive paper is orange, and you can see that decay at the top middle and bottom. It's pretty linear for both systems. This is two gallons per acre and this is five. So it didn't matter how much volume you sprayed, that coverage pattern remained the same. Now it's still kind of hard to compare mylar to papers because you know they're different methods. So if we make the assumption that the paper at the very top of the corn facing up is kind of the best you're ever going to do, if we call that 100%, we can index everything to that position which we did. So assuming the top is the best you're going to do for both collectors, you begin to see just how lockstep 
they actually are. So there's the first takeaway. If you want to do work with water sensitive paper to confirm your coverage, it's a pretty good um, option to, to do that. And if someone says, hey, residue is better, yeah, maybe. But given the cost and the effort, you know, it's nice to have those two options. The second result, we found that overall coverage shared a direct relationship with the volume for both the drone and the overhead broadcast. And I guess this is no surprise to everyone. The more volume you use, the better the coverage. Now, there's diminishing return on that. If you go up to you know, 150 gallons per acre, if you could ever do that, it's not as if you're going to see that much more coverage versus, say, 100 gallons per acre. It, it, it's as in total. It just sort of levels off. There are big gains from 5 to 10 to 15 to 20 gallons per acre, but you know, 50 to 100 gallons per acre, probably not worth the water. I'll get into some detail here. For the drone specifically, spray coverage was significantly reduced when we sprayed at two gallons an acre versus five. And by that, I mean all three different ways of coverage, like minus 58%, 58% less, uh, percent less coverage based on the mylars, uh, like almost 60% based on average area, and like almost 75% based on deposits per square centimeter. So no matter how you slice it, using less water meant considerably less coverage. And we graphed this out, just to, for those who are visual people. Here's the 16.67 gallons per acre applied by broadcast. Here's the average coverage we saw on the top collector facing up, a sad nothing on the top collector facing down. Then we saw how much coverage in the middle, nothing facing down. And at the very bottom of the corn canopy, there's the coverage again, and nothing facing down. Uh, I'm just going to skip over the directed for a moment. That's the, the drop arms. And here's the drone at two gallons per acre and at five gallons per acre. So if we were looking at this strictly as the percent area covered, you could see that the five gallons per acre in the drone did better than the two. But wow, you know, compared to overhead broadcast, kind of sad. This surprised us. There's the 20 gallons per acre with the car wash kind of nozzles. And look, we actually did see coverage on the underside because the spray is directed kind of upward from inside the canopy. So it's it's on the right vector to hit that surface. But it didn't look to cover any more area than even maybe the, the drone at five gallons per acre, which is kind of promising because we know we get great efficacy from this system. I'll talk about that more in a moment because you know it, it baffled us at this point. More results. The directed applications, those, those drop arms, I should mention they made a pretty fine droplet. Those were XR tips, so those are fine medium at best. And they didn't have to travel very far, just a few inches from inside the canopy. Uh, while it did kind of crummy as far as overall percent coverage, it really shone when we started counting droplets. Here's the same histogram again, but not percent coverage, rather counts per square centimeter. The broadcast doesn't look as well, does it? Because great big droplets means fewer droplets. In fact, it's starting to look a lot like the five gallons per acre when you look at uh, how many drops were actually produced. For a contact product, that may play well for the drone. The two, eh, high error and you know just not enough droplets to work with. But look at the directed. That kicked butt. That is a lot of drops per square centimeter. And for a contact product, that may trump the area covered. We're getting near the end. Conversely, let's talk about drift. Our past spray drift was significantly increased in the two gallon per acre treatment versus the five. So coverage suffered for two gallons per acre, but drift went up. If you took every meter of that uh, horizontal flux system and graphed it out, which we've done here, and this is pretty much the scale, there's the drone two meters over the tassel. There's the corn uh, about the right height relative to the drone. And here would be sort of the flux pole at eight meters high. The blue is the amount of drift we intercepted as a percent of the applied rate. Almost 2% of everything sprayed ended up about a meter off the ground for two gallons per acre. And you can just look at this curve, look at the blue curve. And the overall area under that curve gives us a sense of how much volume left the system. Look at five gallons per acre, the red, it's less. So even though we sprayed more, we drift it less. Why? We think it was because of the travel speed. In order to get to five gallons per acre, 
we had to slow down. So we flew at 3.3 meters per second. And there was also a change in pressure there, but we won't get into that. To get to two gallons per acre, we pretty much had to drop the pedal and fly at seven meters per second. And when you do that, the drone tips forward. That increases the proportion of spray that's directed back and out rather than down into the corn. So when that happens, any of the finer droplets in the spray just sort of run out of energy and they end up hovering in the air with gravity not being enough to, to pull them down and they get blown off course. So that kind of explains why we had poorer coverage and higher drift at a lower volume. There weren't many droplets and they were being aimed in the wrong direction. Now, we did this in two fields, so you have to look to see, is there any difference between one field and the other? There shouldn't be. It was the same corn variety planted the same way, and within a few days, the weather we thought would be near enough. But we did see a field effect. There was a significant difference between field one and field two. Field two had lower overall coverage and higher drift, and it didn't matter if we sprayed two or five gallons per acre. So what was happening there? Well, I'll just get a little more specific. Uh, compared to field one, the average coverage in field two was like 30% less at two gallons per acre and like 40% less at five. And drift was up almost 75%. So these are big numbers. This wasn't a small difference. So let's, let's do this a little differently. Let's just lump together all the drift we saw in field one and all the drift we saw in field two. That's what you see here. The red is field two. Look at that drift. It's so much more than field one. So what the heck happened? Well, like I said, the crops were at the same stage of development, same varieties, same planting architecture. The ground was flat. There were you know, no trees around. So what was the difference? It was the wind. We got near the end of the trial, and we've all been there. The wind picks up, and we had to get it done. The average wind speed in field one was almost seven kilometers an hour, pretty reasonable. But on those last couple days, we were up to like 19 kilometers an hour in field two. That's three times as high. So we, it had to be the wind. So here's the take home. You've all been very patient. For the use cases explored in this study, that is like the specific parameters that we used, we'll say that lower volumes and higher travel speeds are not advisable for drones. And you know that's just made even worse in high wind conditions. Also, for those who want to establish a way to look at coverage and be confident in it, both water-sensitive paper and residue samplers together form a complete coverage picture, uh, especially when you're using contact products and finer droplet sizes. If you were to just rinse off a Mylar sheet and say, oh, look, I got 1% of everything I applied here, the same way looking at percent coverage, you, you don't know how that spray was distributed over the target. You really do need to look at deposit density. And these three things together give a very complete picture. But if you're in a bind and you just want to get her done, water-sensitive paper is a viable method. It leads us to future work. And given that this was done last year, we're still hoping to do some of it this year. We would really like to separate travel speed, ambient wind speed, and volume. And that would help clarify their relative influence, both on drift and coverage. Sadly, when you want a higher volume, you kind of have to slow down to do it. So you mush those two variables together, and it's hard to figure out which one caused the difference. Uh, shameless plug, Mark and I wrote a book. This is Air Blast 101. As drones become more and more prevalent, I think we're beginning to understand that you know they're not like any other application system, save one, and that's an air blast sprayer. They use air and how the droplets behave in that air and how they're driven into the crop and how it responds to air, we think is as big a variable as anything else. So anyone that sees these as flying boom sprayers would be mistaken. And if you're curious to learn more about how air and spray and crops behave together, then by all means, go to sprayers101.com and grab a free copy of our book. If you're old school and prefer print, that's available too. And that website is Sprayers 101, something uh, that I put together and host with Dr. Tom Wolf out of Saskatchewan, Canada. And it's kind of everything you never wanted to know about spraying. So we invite you to go there and take in anything you like. Uh, we've got lots of videos, lots of downloadables, lots of authors from all over the world. And we've done our best to make it easy to navigate through a search engine 
and it's completely free to you. And uh, we don't take money from anyone except uh, grower organizations. We're not selling anything. So it's an unbiased opinion. And with that, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference, and I hope that you have lots of hard questions for Mark. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, everybody.